Welcome to the 2015 Western Washington University Athletics Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Uh, I love this day. It's the best day of my year, every year. Something will happen, it'll be memorable, it'll be sad, humorous, whatever, but every, every time something wonderful happens and you'll have a wonderful, wonderful um, afternoon, morning, afternoon. Um, the, as I point out, the Western Hall of Fame is the oldest of all the Hall of Fames in the Pacific Northwest. It began in 1968. Dr. William Tamaris was the athletic director at that time. He, uh, it was his idea, and our first class was in, uh, at a halftime of a basketball game at Carver Gym in 1968, and the uh, initial seven were Sam Carver, who was represented by Dick Carver, Boyd Staggs, Bill Wright, Chuck Erickson, Norm Hash, Robert Tisdale, and Norm Dahl. That was the first class. Then we had um, a lapse for about six years until 1974. We got it going again, and with uh, just a couple of exceptions, we've uh, had it uh, every year since, and this will be the 40th one, which is pretty cool. Uh, today we'll be inducting uh, Kerry Brout Caviezel, Jim Pearson, and Orlando Steinauer. Later, you will be hearing about their accomplishments, and they are many and impressive. But I will say before everything else that they are even better people than anything that they've done and have been great ambassadors for our school and for our athletics program. I'd like to begin by introducing uh, some Western staff and coaches and other dignitaries. I've got um, our senior vice president who oversees student affairs and academic services, Dr. Eileen Coughlin, right over here. <laughs> our director of athletics, Steve Card, who's going to say a few words. Well, thank you and good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Athletics, I'd like to welcome you all to the, our Hall of Fame ceremony. I have to agree with Paul. What a wonderful day it is, you know, standing out front in the, in the front foyer there and uh, seeing a lot of, a lot of faces of people that I haven't seen in quite some time. It, was, uh, it really makes it a special day for all of us here at Western. Uh, this is a very special day, as, as you know, as we get to honor three of our former student athletes and as, on their induction to our Hall of Fame. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge some very important, two very, very important groups that are here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, recognize the several members of our Hall of Fame that are in attendance today. Paul will recognize you individually, but I'd like you all to, I saw several of you come in today, I'd like you all to stand and be recognized as a group, if you would, all of our Hall of Fame members. <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize another very important group. Uh, in, the, in the back half of the room is all of our student athletes. Uh, you know, I, I made a comment last night. We had dinner with the, uh, with the three inductees, and I made a comment to them that uh, uh, you, they are the people whose shoulders that you all stand on today. They have set the foundation for Western athletics and the excellence that it is. So who knows, there may be a Hall of Fame member or two amongst all of you here today. But today is about Kerry, Jim, and Orlando. Congratulations to all three of you. You are now considered Western Athletics Royalty. Enjoy the ceremony. I wish I could talk like that. <laughs> you know, Western had an excellent start to this 2014-15 uh, athletics season with four of our five fall sports teams all reaching the postseason. And the one that uh, didn't reach it was within one win of doing so, and that's going to change next year. Um, now we're getting down to cases with the men's and women's basketball, each ready for the postseason um, next week, and all of the spring sports have great expectations. It should be noted that Western has placed in the top 20 among 300 NCAA Division II schools in the Sports Directors' Cup National Sports Standings for each of the last seven years. And the Vikings have won the last six uh, and 11 overall Great Northwest Athletic Conference All-Sports Championships, and our student-athletes have achieved this while 
having an NCAA academic success rate of 84% compared to the national average of 71%. Great job. Now it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, members of our Western Athletics Hall of Fame in attendance today. Um, we don't have an RSVP, so I, I'm, I may miss somebody, but if I do, let me know and we'll go from there. But um, first on our list, a men's basketball forward, early 60s, possibly the best rebounder for his size in school history. Uh, I just want to let him know that I was talking to Chuck Randall recently and who uh, was a Hall of Fame uh, bas men's basketball coach for us. And he said that uh, if it hadn't been for Jim buying into his program, that uh, he never would have been able to do what he did at Western. So Jim Adams, right over here. <laughs> Best men's uh, tennis player in Western history, Steve Chronister. How's that one? Uh, he led the men's, uh, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if he's here. Ron Crow, are you here? Yeah, he said he was going to be. Okay, so we got um, a three-time all-district and one of our all-time leading scorers, Lori DeCover. I saw her. <laughs> uh, men's rowing coach at Western in the 1970s. Coached a varsity four that placed fourth at the IRA uh, championship finals, coached two Olympic rowers, and rowed collegiately at the UW. He's won all kinds of gold medals in uh, Masters Rowing. Bob Deal. <laughs> Men's track and cross country, outstanding girls basketball coach, major outstanding girls basketball coach at Mount Baker High School. He'll be uh, playing a key role in today's ceremony. Jim Freeman. Our women's soccer team over the last three years has had remarkable success um, going to the final four one of those years. Earlier in our history, uh, about 1984, 85, 86, maybe 83, our, um, we had another stretch. And during that stretch, we won 38 straight games, one of the collegiate's longest running streaks in women's soccer. And uh, the other thing that was that we came within, in 1984, we came within that close of uh, that being the first team that would have uh, won a national title in, in Western history. And the coach of that team is here, Dominic Gargiul. <laughs> a football wide receiver, he caught a pass in every game of his four year career, 37. Didn't play as many games in the, at that time. Um, member of the district championship team that beat PLU 48-28. Uh, past president of the board of uh, the Western Foundation. Student at Ferndale High School, which is close to me, and also uh, where Jim Pearson, one of our inductees, taught. And I understand that he's uh, a marathon runner now, and uh, maybe he got that from Jim. I don't, I'm not sure. Hoyt Geyer. We have another former Hall of Famer that wasn't able to be here, but he sent a letter, and I want to uh, read a couple of the uh, paragraphs. Um, the player is Butch Giroux. He was an All-America football defensive lineman. He was a pro wrestler. He played in the Canadian Football League with uh, Winnipeg. And uh, here's a couple things that he said. As a previous inductee into Western's Hall of Fame, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Orlando into this honored group. Your induction is a formal recognition of all that you achieved and, well, and a well-deserved thank you for representing our school so well. I am indeed sorry I can't be there, but today with you to, uh, to celebrate today. I am honored and blessed to have been given the opportunity to contribute to Western's acknowledgement of your achievements. Uh, congratulations, Orlando. You have made us all proud, and I'm certain that uh, your beautiful wife and three daughters are sharing this wonderful day with you. Gina and the other two daughters a little ways away. Uh, my one regret, Arlando, is that you are not a head coach, that is that you are not the head coach of the BC Lions. I have no doubt that your CFL 
head coaching leadership role is only a blink away. Let's drill. A legendary coach and AD, Hall of Fame basketball coach, 411 wins uh, in 19 seasons, 26 years as AD, nine national titles. Uh, she coached today's inductee, Carrie Caviezel, Linda Goodrich. <laughs> Men's basketball guard, uh, Western Athlete of the Year in 1962, played in the first game in Carver Gym, had hops before they were popular, Mike Kirk. Women's basketball forward, twice Wade Tri Trophy finalist, all divisions, top 12 players in the country. It's like the Heisman in football. Uh, best player in the 20th century, possibly of all time. Most beautiful jump shot in the world, Joe Metzger Levine. Let's see, did Genevieve make it? Ah, an All-American in track and cross country and Western's Female Athlete of the Year in 1984 and 1985, Genevieve Fuller Roguski. He was an NAIA Hall of Fame basketball co coach. He began the first boys basketball summer camp west of the Appalachian Mountains and, invent and invented the slam duck rim. Uh, his 1971-72 team reached the NEIA quarterfinals. He's known as the coach's coach, Chuck Randall. <laughs> he was an assistant football coach for 20 seasons at Western. A good definition of the word coach would be two words, Terry Todd. Another person I'd like to recognize that's here today is our former head football coach and a defensive coordinator when Orlando played, and he's currently an assistant with the BC Lions, Robin Ross. I know I for, I'm sure I forgot somebody or didn't rec see somebody, but um, just remember, what's that? I said I see Pat Lockerbie. Oh, that's right. I saw him too. First. All-America running back, first person in the state of Washington to run for 4,000 yards and uh, all everything, Pat Locker. <laughs> you joined Exclusive Company because one time uh, when Linda was our AD, I blew it and forgot her, so. Uh, and I'm still here, so that was a good thing, yeah. So um, today we honor the Western Athletics Hall of Fame class of 2015. They include a standout basketball player, one of the country's greatest runners for distances over 30 miles, and a football All-America who has gone on to professional fame. They are women's basketball player Carrie Brout Caviezel, cross country and track and field runner, athlete Jim Pearson, and football player Orlando Steinauer. With the addition of today's inductees, the membership of Western's Hall of Fame increases to 132. When you consider that athletics began at Western in 1902, you see how exclusive this group really is. Our first inductee today is Carrie Browett Caviezel. When she graduated, Carrie was one of only two women's basketball players in Western history to be ranked among the top 10 career leaders in points, rebounds, assists, steals, and block shots. When you consider that the other player was Joe Metzger-Levine, that makes that distinction doubly noteworthy. Kerry was a team captain as a junior on, a, on the 1988-89 squad that finished 30-5. and five. They're over there. And the first and only 30-win women's hoop squad in school history. They won district and by district uh, playoff titles and reached the quarterfinals at the NEI National Tournament. And while she was doing there, she was also re uh, writing a daily piece for the um, Bellingham Herald while she was uh, at Nationals. So that was pretty good. 
As a senior, Carey was named a NAIA District 1 All-Star on a 26-4 team that ranked sixth nationally in the final poll. She averaged 11.5 points, 6.8 rebounds, and led Western assists for the third straight year at 4.4. During her four-year career, Carey started all but four games for the Vikings, who were 95 and 28 during that stretch and never missed a contest. Carey was named to Western's President's List nine times and was a NAIA National Scholar Athlete. Carey and husband Jim have three children, Bo, 15, Lynn, 13, and David, 5. Carey's presenters are Western Hall of Famer Jim Freeman, who she coached and taught with at uh, Mount Baker Junior Senior High, and former teammate and great friend Becky Hudson Rawlings, that's a surprise, uh, who is now the Director of Human Resources at Whatcom Community College. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Freeman and Becky Rawlings. I just freaked her out. She just said to me, be nice. <laughs> that chance. <clears throat> well, uh, we were going to open up by asking where Carrie is because Carrie has a uh, reputation for uh, showing up late. But uh, since they already introduced her, you know that, that she's here. Actually, and you know what, Freeman? I told her that it started at 10.30 today ah. so I could get her here. Yeah. yeah, there you go. The other thing I need to point out is that uh, Becky is uh, an amateur ventriloquist. So I guess you know what that makes me. <laughs> All right, dummy, let's get going. <laughs> so Freeman, how, how did you first meet Carrie? Well, actually, uh, uh, she called. Uh, she actually got a position at Mount Baker being the, uh, uh, a student teacher at our elementary school. And uh, she called one night and asked if I needed any help with basketball. Now, uh, my immediate response was to uh, follow what Carmen Dolfo once said about me. Uh, I invited Carmen to come out and speak to my ba girls' basketball team one time, and Carmen opened up and said, you know, not everybody doesn't know everything about basketball. She said, your, your assistant coach, Kent Sherwood, at the time doesn't know everything about basketball, and, and Carrie Browett doesn't know everything about basketball, and Jim Freeman doesn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been a Freudian slip, but when Carrie called, uh, that uh, I was really excited that she would be interested in, in helping us out. So that's how we met. And for the first practice, she came uh, late. And so <laughs> <laughs> so um, my first encounter, we had an informational meeting for anyone interested in playing basketball. And there was a room full of gals. And I didn't talk to her at that moment. But the next day, we were walking in front of Old Main. And we crossed, and we stopped each other, and said, weren't you at the, game, or at the meeting yesterday? And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so great. An upperclassman that will take me under her wing. She had just this amazing presence, and I thought, this is going to be so smooth. Then we started talking a little bit, and found out she was a freshman. <laughs> and then talking a little bit more, and I found out I was older than her. <laughs> by two weeks, and I thought, oh my gosh, I gotta be the mature one in the group. <laughs> so, um, as you'll soon see, she has an amazing presence about herself, but one of the most endearing things was when um, freshman and sophomore year, she lived in the dorms, and they'd shut down during the uh, Christmas break, so she'd come live with my folks and I. So we bonded right away, and my family included her, in everything, and her family did the same for me. Then when we'd go over and play in Ellensburg on Fridays, then we would spend the weekend in Ellensburg. And I can't not be up here and share kind of a funny story. Well, if you live in Cleelum, 
Ellensburg, a weekend in Ellensburg is a really big thing. Yeah, it is a big thing. It is a big, it is a big thing. It is a big thing. <laughs> oh, Roslyn. Sorry. Correction. Yeah. Roslyn. Roslyn. Clalem's a suburb. Yeah, of it's a it's a big. That's <laughs> that's a big town. Yeah. It's a big town. So, so my freshman year, we're there. I've never been there before, and her dad. Um, was an a incredible snowmobiler. Yeah. And they thought that it would be fun to take me out on a snowmobile and have my own. And if you notice number 13 over there, the guns that I had on the, my biceps, um, <laughs> or lack thereof. So they gave me my own snowmobile. Dave led. Carrie had her own snowmobile. We get across the driveway and I dump it. And they're already gone. And they have to come back, and they have to get me. And um, I was really embarrassed. So then, furthermore, they put me in the middle of two of them, so I couldn't do that again. Yep. But I couldn't smart move. Smart family. No, yeah. Smart family. Yeah. And I couldn't move my arms for practice on Monday because <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was fun, but whoa, at a cost. Yeah. Well, there are milestones in people's lives, and. Uh, one of them was uh, for, for Carrie, when she was my assistant coach at Mount Baker, uh, we brought our team to Western's summer basketball camp. And uh, Carrie was helping me. She was also taking summer classes, but she was helping me out. And one, one day she said, uh, Freeman, uh, I'm not going to be at, at uh, our scrimmages tomorrow night. And I said, why? And she said, well, I, uh, I've got a blind date down in, in Skagit. And I look at her and I said, now where are your priorities? <laughs> anyway, is a date more important than basketball? How could this be? And, and she said, well, I'm, I'm going. I'm going on this date, blind date. So the next day she comes back. And we'd had many talks about how do you know when you're in love and all this stuff. And I told her, you know, you're going to hear bells. They'll go up. And, and she came back the next day. She said, remember what you said about the bells? I said, yeah. She said, well, I think they went off. I said, you're kidding. And she said, no. She said, I said, I have to meet this guy. So she brought him the next day. She brings him to the upper gym, one of the upper floors up there. And my team is warming up, girls basketball players, warming up. They're two lines, they're shooting layups, getting rebounds, coming, doing all this stuff. And Jim Caviezel walks in to the gym. And it was as if my girls had never played basketball in their lives. <laughs> the ball was bouncing off their feet. And the ultimate embarrassment was one of them went up for a layup and the ball got stuck between the rim and the backboard. <laughs> Embarrassing not only for them, but for me because I can't jump high enough to knock it out. <laughs> that only leaves one person, Jim Caviezel. <laughs> and he walks over, pops up in the air, knocks the ball loose, and all the girls are going, oh. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like show off. <laughs> and that's how I met Jim Caviezel. And uh, that's quite a milestone. <laughs> and I'll add a couple pieces to that. So um, Carrie was at my house with Jim's sister, and Carrie left. And she said to me, I have a brother that needs to meet her. And out of the blue, uh, Jim called me and said, I hear you have a friend that I need to meet. And I said, well, yeah, I have a friend, and you could meet her. And uh, he said, uh, but I hear she's out of the country. He said, yeah, she's in uh, England with her brother. And he's like, well, what if I go up to the airport and meet her when she gets off the plane? And I said, oh, that sounds like such a great idea. And my mom was the voice of reason and said, are you crazy? <laughs> and I got thinking afterwards, I probably would not be sitting up here today 
if I would have let that happen. So my mom was the voice of reason, and thankfully Carrie and I are still friends after 24 years of, of that. So I'd like to conclude uh, with a little analogy. I, I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Forrest Gump. And in the movie, there's a feather, a white feather that kind of starts off at the movie getting floating around, and, there's, and it's at the end of the movie, and it gets wafted by the wind, and it represents the life of Forrest Gump. And his life was pretty well buffeted by whatever winds blew his way. And if you look at that and extend it a little bit, there are actually billions of feathers floating around. There's seven billion people on the planet. But every now and then, there is a feather that has its own power. It has its own energy. It's not buffeted by the wind, but somehow has its own purpose and direction. And those feathers, when they move through, they bump other feathers. And the feathers they bump start moving in directions of their own. And they bump other feathers, and so on. I've had coaches like that. I look down the list of, of today's program, and I can count many people, athletes who were teammates, coaches. I think the program at Western itself, its athletic program, gives us that kind of direction. And I really believe, and I've noted uh, in the years that I've known her since 1990, that Carrie brought Caviezel is one of those kind of people who makes people change their direction in life because her values are so strong. Comes from that kind of a family, that kind of a community, and Western has been blessed. I have, she has, and we're very proud that you are about to speak. Thank you. You guys need to take that act on the road. <laughs> Please welcome Carrie Browett Caviezel. So I get a chance to redeem myself after that. <laughs> um, I want to start by uh, recognizing Joe and Lori. Lori, where are you sitting? There you are. You, if you want to know how good they were, I think about this now at 46 years old. They came back and they would play in the alumni game and they were still able to hang with us and play and outshoot us. That's how good they were. I think about my ability to play with you girls, there's no way. I could go up and down once without being out of breath. So thank you for coming today. I want to start by thanking Paul Madison, the sports information director, and Steve Card the athletic director, for putting this entire weekend together without your efforts and time, as well as people behind the scenes that we don't even know about. This event wouldn't be possible. I want to congratulate Jim and Orlando on well-deserved inductions into the Hall of Fame. You've had exemplary careers at Western and way beyond. It's an honor for me to be inducted in this class of inductees. I want to thank my family, friends, and former teammates that have traveled from near and far to be here today. It truly means the world to me. Most of all, I thank God above for all his blessings and his challenges that make us who we are. When Becky Rawlings, my dear friend of 24 <laughs> years and former teammate, called me to tell me that I'd been selected to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, my reaction was nothing short of utter surprise. You see, when you play a team sport, you think about everything in that light. In team sports, awards are usually accolades given to the team. Conference titles, state titles, wins and losses in your seasons. So from the moment Paul asked Becky to call me to this moment standing in front of you, I've been, I began thinking about all the people and all the teams that I've been a part in my 14-year basketball career that got me to this point. I started thinking about the most important lessons I learned from these people and the greatest game ever. I guess I would summarize it to this list. I learned the power of possibility, the power of preparation, and the power of perseverance. 
The power of possibility was the first lesson I learned. In the beginning, I was immensely blessed to play on several amazing teams. I grew up in Clallam Roslyn. Yes, it is that small. There are more people in our cemetery than walking around in the town. <laughs> it's five little towns that make up the team, and what a place to grow up, and what an incredible basketball legacy. I grew up playing against my sister, who was two years older, and my two older brothers. So you might say that competitiveness was a natural instinct. The teachers would call her Jamal Wilkes from the Lakers because she was such a smooth shooter. They would call me Charles Barkley. <laughs> at the time, I didn't really appreciate that at 14. In 1981 and 82, I watched my older sister start on a team that won back-to-back -back state titles. What that did for me as a young athlete was give me the vision of what to dream for and introduced me to that incredible power of belief. From the time I stepped on the court as a freshman, I already knew that anyone could win on any given night, that the victory didn't always go to the best team. Think about one of the most legendary examples of this, the 1980 US Olympic hockey team. A bunch of college athletes beat the most powerful Soviet team in the world. Unthinkable, but yet, if you are old enough, and most of you are not in the back, <laughs> but if you're old enough to remember this, it was imprinted on your brain, as in one of the greatest sporting events we've ever witnessed. I can think of many times in high school where we played teams with a lot more talent, and we were able to win. When a team has the power of possibility and a singular vision, they believe that if they go out and play every single second of the game with the intensity of a champion, anything can happen. When I was a junior in high school, we were playing for the state championship. The team we were playing was much more talented and a lot bigger. The thing is that we didn't know that, and we certainly didn't believe that. We got way behind in the first half, but I just knew if we could keep it under 20 points that we could come back. The difference in the score at halftime was 19 points. This was the first year of hosting the tournament at the Tacoma Dome. So for me, a kid from Cleallum, to play on the Tacoma Dome was, dropping, was like dropping a Monopoly board in the middle of this immense gym. The fans were, and the bleachers were a million miles away. It just, it didn't feel like a gymnasium. I guess my dad must have thought the same thing, because when we ran out at halftime, he managed to get past the security guard, and he was sitting at the end of our bench. <laughs> you might say that I was surprised and couldn't imagine how he'd gotten down there, but it only furthered my belief that we would win, and we did. When I look back over my basketball career, it's amazing to me that all of my coaches were female. That's a powerful role model to a young female athlete, and at that time, ladies, that was not the case. There weren't a lot of female head coaches, like there is today. So when I met Lydia Goodrich on the recruiting trip to Western, it felt like home. As a matter of fact, I remember taking one recruiting trip to a rival school prior to coming to Western. I won't mention the school, but it was close by to where I lived. <laughs> And most of what the coach talked about wasn't their strength. He talked about why I shouldn't go to Western. And I figured, well, this must be the place. I figured this legendary Western women's coach must really be doing something right if even the other coaches were afraid of her. Here was this incredible, strong female coach that I could relate to and knew that it was where I wanted to come play. The list of thank yous would not be complete without thanking Coach Linda Hopper, an assistant coach at Western, my first year for having a lot of faith in me. As a matter of fact, Becky and I share a remarkable stat. We played on the last team of Linda Goodrich's career. And we also played for Carmen Dolfo because she was our assistant coach. The very, she was our first, that's the first year she assistant coached. So you might say we played with two legendary coaches. And you all know how well Carmen's story is turning out. She's doing pretty well. Both were incredible competitors and both knew how to win. Most of all, they knew how to prepare, and this is where I learned the power of preparation. Linda was grace and calm under pressure. What an incredible gift for me to witness as a young woman on a daily basis. Linda seemed to know what to do, when to do it on a split second. 
The longer I was in the program, I realized that this came from years of preparation. She literally intimidated most of the coaches and the referees, I might add. <laughs> because she knew the game better and had been coaching the game longer than all of them. Yet she rarely had to yell at us as players to get her point across. Just knowing that she could was enough. No one wanted to see that look, but more important, no one wanted to disappoint her. When someone brings that kind of expertise to the court, she commands a respect from those that play for her. Linda reminded me of another strong female legendary coach from Tennessee, Pat Head Summit. I remember watching Summit in an interview and being fascinated with her confidence and her feistiness. I also distinctly remember something Summit said. She commented that when she started coaching, she could really push her athletes to be the best. But as the years went on, she had to walk more gingerly around what she, how she said things and what she said. The power to motivate through honest and direct criticism is an important component in, in athletics, and it's often lost. It's also an important component in life. Everybody likes to hear what they do well, but that isn't how we improve. My father always used to say after a game, you know what you did well, you need to focus on what you're not doing well. I don't ever remember thinking when I um, heard a coach criticize me that it was personal. I took it as a reason to get better, and I felt they must believe in me and believe that I could. As a matter of fact, as I began coaching, I used to tell my players, if I'm taking the time to criticize you, I must believe in your talent. When you, when you need to worry is when I stop saying anything to you. I learned so much from Western's program about being calm under pressure. Linda called me into her office the start of my sophomore year, and she told me that she was going to make me one of the two team captains because I was so calm. Late, but calm. <laughs> Literally, I nearly fell off my chair. I kept thinking, Carrie, be calm, act calm, seem calm. <laughs> I was so scared my heart was beating a million miles in my chest. But I thought, if this woman believes in me and thinks I'm calm, dang it, I'm going to be calm. I can do this. When someone believes in your abilities that much, you have to step up to, plate, to the plate and believe in yourself. Western recruited me to play small forward to be ready to follow in the footsteps of a talented senior after she graduated. I had spent my whole high school career with my back to the basket as a forward, in my last year as a center. And I didn't know anything about being a guard. But I knew there was an opening that season for a shooting guard, and I hated sitting on the bench. I didn't know a lot about handling the ball, but I figured I could learn. Players, figure out what your team needs most and fill those gaps. This is how you get on the court. That is how you make a difference in the game and in the play of your teammates. Players thank your teammates every day for pushing you. It is through relentless practice that you will become the best player you can be. I owe a lot to my teammates who consistently push me in practice to be better. You know, several times in this process, people have asked me what my greatest strength as a player was. It certainly wasn't being flashy. <laughs> I believed that I could beat opponents with consistency. I almost never was the one with the most points. But I believed if I could consistently score 10 to 12 points, get 10 rebounds, make four assists, steal the ball twice a game, block two shots, and keep the person I was guarding under 10 points, then I had done everything I could do. One of the greatest compliments that a coach has ever given me was when Coach Goodrich said, she did everything that we asked her to do. That was my goal. I believed if I did everything that I was asked to do and everyone else did everything that they were asked to do, that we would win. You can't stop one player. You can't stop five. And that was the key that I took into coaching. When I finished my playing career, I started student teaching and assistant coaching under Jim Freeman. It was from him I learned the valuable lesson of the power of perseverance. He would often say, out endure. Trouble comes and people can be difficult to deal with, but out endure them. What an incredible life lesson for me to learn at an early age. Years later, I would meet John Wooden from UCLA basketball fame, and I was struck by the similarities in Wooden and Freeman on their personal outlooks. 
First and foremost, they were teachers. Coach Wooden once said to me that he would wander around UCLA's campus and pop into classes. If it was interesting, then he would sit down and listen to the lecture. He said the teacher could have been talking about auto mechanics. He didn't care, as long as they had passion for what they were teaching. Freeman shared that same philosophy. Love the game, love your players, and love what you do. And that love will be infectious. I, I guess I saved the most important lesson that the game basketball has taught me for last. The power of family and the power of prayer. I was so blessed to have a supportive family. My oldest brother is here tonight, and I can't think of anyone who genuinely, genuinely has been more supportive and happy for me every accomplishment I have ever had. My dear husband was not able to make it because of work commitments, but it is his love and his continued belief in me that has given me the strength to continue to challenge myself well beyond the court. And I knew he was thinking of me on Wednesday. I flew in Tuesday. I um, went over to eastern central Washington, and I, I, we went to, to church. And up walks this man from our parish, an elderly man. And he had a big grin on his face, and he said, Carrie, that is so exciting. On Saturday, you're going to receive an Oscar. <laughs> And I said, that would be your humor, Jim. That would be your humor. But I knew what he meant. My three children, Bo and Lily and David, you are my life. You are the best thing that's ever happened to me. L lastly, my parents, Dave and Jean Browett, they were and they are my foundation. In the 14 years of playing, this is a true stat. My parents literally never missed a volleyball match, a basketball game, or a track meet. If I had any calm about me, it was because I would look up into the stands before every single contest and unfailingly see my parents sitting there. Parents, you can't imagine what that does for a child. I know what it did for me. My mom and dad would drive three hours to Bellingham, three hours back in the same night, game after game to watch me play. My mother is here in the audience tonight. My father passed away two years ago, coming in April. Still, the memory of his spirit is always with me every day. And I know most of all, he would be the most proud of this award. When I was in high school, he used to yell my name from the stands. My dad was the calmest man, but not at basketball games. <laughs> and he would yell my name. He'd say, Carrie, get it going out there. And I would hear that, and I would laugh. But I would crank it up, as he would say. Well, when I hit college, college, I graduated to being called by my number. He would say, come on, number 12. Well, I'm pretty sure that tonight, my dad is up there right now calling out my number. Thank you. You know, some things never change. Linda Goodrich is still trying to intimidate referees, and she's doing it from the second row of the reserve seats. <laughs> also, I want to, one thing, I saw another person here that I want to, uh, Pat, you weren't the only one. Uh, this person climbed the north face of Mount Everest uh, during his, uh, with no oxygen. The north face of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, with no oxygen. He's climbed six or seven others that are basically the same unbelievable achievements. He just got through uh, with his sons uh, a year ago of climbing Mount Rainier, that little hill, <laughs> for the 180th time. Uh, Larry Nielsen. <laughs> Thank you.
Larry uh, participated in track and cross country for us. Our next inductee is Jim Pearson. Since his early 20s, Jim has devoted himself to distance and ultra distance running, both as a participant and coach. In 1975, Jim was the US champion in the 50 mile run, setting an American record with a time of five hours, 12 minutes and 41 seconds. The clocking was then the third fastest in the world and still ranks seventh all time on the American list. He also was a national champion in 1988 in the Masters 50 mile run. Jim qualified for the US Olympic marathon trials in 1972 and 1976. In all, he competed in four world championships and he placed among the top five at the US national championships seven times. Jim had an 11 and a half year stretch where he averaged over 100 miles per week. He ran 6,174 miles in 1975 and 6,028 miles in 1978. Now 70, Jim is still working on a streak of running at least a mile a day. It began on February 16, 1970 and has reached 45 years. 16,449 days, and I know he did it today because he was at, he stayed at our house last night. <laughs> we made sure that he got it in. And that's the third longest documented string ever in the United States. Jim coached high school and collegiate cross country and track for 39 years, 34, 35 of them at Ferndale High School. Seven of his athletes have qualified for the US Olympic trials and another seven for world championship meets. He's coached 55 national qualifiers, 30 All-Americans. Um, Jim and Barb have three grown children, sons Hopper and Joel and, and daughter Paige, and another son Rob that are all here today. And Pearson, or Jim, was once referred, referred to by Runner's World as an ultra-running king. I think that's a pretty uh, apt description. Jim's presenter is Jim Freeman, who was a teammate and one of the first people he met at Western. And they have remained great friends along with a fellow teammate, Gail Fuller, who's also here today, who is, um, the three of them and their wives get together at least three times a year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome again, Jim Freeman. I do have some notes, but uh, it's, it's interesting to be up here uh, and talking about one athlete who I worked with starting in 1990 and another one who started back in 1962. <laughs> uh, and, and what's nice about it, uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, George Burns quote when he was reached his 100th birthday. They asked him how he felt and he says, at my age it feels good to be anywhere. <laughs> and and uh, that's kind of the way I feel. Now, here we are in our 70s and we look back, uh, way back, when uh, running wasn't a, a national fad. It was something that uh, very few people knew how to coach and that most of your training was done on what you thought up yourself. And the motivation came from within. And you just simply were your own uh, monitor. And Jim uh, didn't start out as a distance runner. He started out as a long jumper. So you look at his picture, you know, I think especially this one. You look at the legs, and if I was up here wearing shorts, uh, mine would be about half the size <laughs> of his. So he developed a, a great deal of strength and speed uh, through his long jumping. He was a 21-foot long jumper, plus 21 feet. So that's pretty good, although you only have to run 150 feet. <laughs> and, and then you collapse into a nice sandy pit. <laughs> so the, the training wasn't, uh, wasn't that strenuous for him. 
And so back in, in uh, college, he, he got interested in, with the, uh, the distance runners in running cross country. And Gail Fuller, who was a hurdler, not a distance runner, and they both didn't realize where their strength was until later till after I left, and then they, they just took over. And so I think, I think you don't always know where your niche is. And, and when you, you look at running an ultra marathon, it's, it's a whole lot different type of approach mentally. Think about driving 50 miles. You hop in your car and you go. Okay, you run 50 miles. Most people don't set out to run 50 miles. They might run 10 and feel good and run another five, but they don't set out to run 50 miles. That's, that's 200 laps around the track. So it's, it's a, a real uh, challenge, emotionally and mentally. So when you talk about running that kind of a distance. You're talking about endurance, but you're also talking about durability, and they're not the same. And then you're talking about perseverance, and that's another component. And all those things require uh, an inner strength that uh, most of us don't have and most of us don't want to have. <laughs> so, so, <coughs> It's, it's an, unusual, an unusual thing. Um, when I look back on, our, on those old days uh, where we would test out what running was, and sometimes those, those, uh, the, the, the idea of running 100 miles a week uh, was foreign. People just didn't do that. And, and if you think about 100 miles a week, it's almost 14 miles a day, every day, every day, every day, every day. And Jim did that for, what, 11 years? I did that for 16 weeks. And I was really proud of it. <laughs> 11 years, wow, that's amazing. And, and so, uh, our friendship goes back so many years, and I look at the kind of perseverance that he has. One day he got hurt. He got hit by a car or something and was in the hospital. He's in the hospital now, okay? My wife, Helen, is sitting right over there, uh, and I went to visit him, and Joel was there, sitting with him. Joel has a running streak of his own. And we visited for a while. We left about 10.30 at night. Jim was in the hospital bed. Helen and I got in our car and I told Helen, Jim is going to run tonight. She said, how? I, I don't know, but <laughs> he is going to do it. And he did. Now, the sneaky Joel uh, found a uh, treadmill in one of the uh, testing centers, wheeled Jim down to the treadmill, and Jim legally ran one mile on the treadmill with one leg that was uh, badly damaged, let's put it that way. And if the doctors knew that he did that, uh, they would have sued him. <laughs> <coughs> So that's, that's the kind of perseverance he had. And uh, it's, it's just amazing. And to, uh, to accomplish what he did and have a loving family around him as well and many friends, uh, we're very, very, very proud of him. And so it's a great... Pleasure for me to introduce Jim Pierce.
since we are all a, a product of our en environments and our heredity, I have to start by thanking my parents. I'm getting too old and emotional. Um, my mother is 93. She's at home by herself, uh, cleans her floor, washes her dishes, um, gets scolded by my brother for doing these things. But she's always been a, a really tough person. My father, uh, at age 65, was diagnosed with cancer, the first of about three or four of them. And he still chopped his wood. I, he ordered two cards of wood, and I cut one of them because um, you know, I didn't want to kill himself, and he got mad and ordered more. Uh, <laughs> he, he didn't, you know, you put your logs up and you whack a couple times and, and, and hope that they split. He never put them up. He just would swing, and sweat would drip off his nose. Uh, a few years after chemotherapy started, uh, I was down there one day, and he said, I, I got tired today. I said, well, what'd you do? And he says, not much. I cut a couple cords of wood. I drove a tractor on the farm, and I changed the oil in the pickup. But that didn't count. <laughs> and so I, I was really concerned. My dad was tired. And I was running to my brothers the next day, and I thought, well, my gosh, he, he's almost 70, and he's got cancer and stuff. It, it just didn't even dawn on me that my parents got tired. Um, so I've got some of the environment and uh, the genetics, I guess, to help me get through some of these runs. i like to thank Western, Paul, and everybody involved, um, first of all, for waiting so long, because if you judge me off what I did in, at Western, I, I don't even get a vote. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. I saw outstanding as a freshman that when the Clipson came out at the end of the year, I was tagged as John Smith II. <laughs> no, so I, I must not have impressed my coach a lot. Um, <laughs> well, goodness, I, I wrote notes and I can't see them. Um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when I, <laughs> the perils of being old. Um, when I was interviewed by the Herald, um, I felt really bad because, well, first of all, I was embarrassed because I didn't know Linda was in the uh, Hall of Fame, and I thought, there's no way I should go in before Linda Goodrich, my, my hero, my shero. Um, <laughs> she had won so many games, and then she was an outstanding athletic director, and I was saving all the clippings from the Bellingham Herald. Um, but then I found out she was in, so I was a little more comfortable. Um, <laughs> but the guy was asking me these questions, and, you know, first of all, I enjoyed my experience at Western. I have no complaints at all. But he wanted an epiphany or something where I became this great runner, and it didn't happen. Uh, I have only two memorable mem moments. We had a double dual meet against uh, Linfield and Willamette. I, I won both the, uh, Jim called them long jump, we didn't do that. The broad jump, I won them against both colleges, and I won the hop, step, and jump against both. And in cross country, I hate to put Jim down, but I was the most important runner on Western's first ever district championship team. Because it takes five to be a team. We had five. And during the race, now Jim's getting third place, but, you know, big deal. Uh, third place isn't going to help you if your fifth guy doesn't finish. And somewhere late in the race, I caught up with the 440 runner uh, who had quit. And one of the rules in running is you just crush them right there because then they can, don't come back and beat you. But he, he had quit. And so I talked him into running with me. And then when he could see the finish line, well, then I was toast. But we did have five finishers. And we won the thing. And the trophy's still in the case, I hope. Uh, <laughs> even has our names on it. Um, what I really got out of Western with was a very good education. Uh, we, had to, we had humanities, 24 credits, I believe, and you didn't get to pick and choose what you called humanities. You took these courses where it's like four days a week in a history class, three days in a lit class. Every other week, you alternated an hour with art and music. And so uh, we were prepared. Uh, what I came out of Western with 
other than education was I had lifelong friends. And well, I, uh, Gail Fuller was mentioned, first person I ever met from Western. I was two weeks after high school, sitting in my car at Tumwater High School for a summer meet. And this guy walks by me with a blue jacket on and it said, Western Washington State College of Education. It took the entire back of his uniform. So I jumped out and, and ran after him and uh, met the, the world's nicest individual. And uh, he explained to me all about Western and we became friends and we still are. Uh, first day of practice, practice meant a bunch of guys showed up together is all. Uh, halfway up Seaholm Hill, this guy I recognized from summer meets, Jim Freeman, says, you want to go by me? <laughs> me go by anybody? Uh, it, it just, it, it really surprised me. And uh, he, well, actually later, he played a big part in my continuing. As he said, people didn't run after college. And so I was talking about, you know, what I might be doing uh, about, a, I think about a year and a half before I graduated because he was still in the school, and he says, well, if you're thinking of quitting, you may as well quit now. And I, what? And he said, you know, if, you're, if you love running, you just keep doing it. And uh, so that was the end of that kind of thought. It wasn't like I was going to run every day, but I, I just wasn't going to quit. Um, I went to Western between coaches. I, I went to run for Ray Cizik. He His last year was the year before I got there. And we didn't even have a cross-country coach. Uh, I don't know who made up the workouts that we met, and Jim would probably say, well, we're going down to Cornwall Park, so we'd run over to Cornwall Park and, and do our run and come back, and I don't know if there was logic to anything. You know, I, I just did what the older guys, he says, no, <laughs> I did what the older guys did. <laughs> but again, fortunately, I'm, n I'm not up here for anything I did in, in college. Um, and, no, okay. I know I need to thank John Hunt. John Hunt is in Western's Hall of Fame as a long jumper. He went 24 feet. Remember, I was a long jumper, broad jumper. He came along with Dick Perferman as well, and my senior year, jumping was a history then. You know, if you've got guys this good. So I, I ran the two mile, and. I was student teaching, so every week I got the same time. I got worse shape every week because I wasn't going to practices, and, but I learned more. And, and so but gradually uh, I stayed a 10 10 2 miler. Uh, I think the track team is still here. Keep that in mind. Um, 10 10, ran a 503 in high school. Uh, some of you girls have already run faster than that, women um, faster than that. Um, So, this is terrible. I should have uh, used typing and stuff. Anyhow, um, so I, I told you I was embarrassed about the, um, not, I couldn't really say what the, the guy wanted. And he wanted me to say things about Western. But I did get coaching from Western. Because I think two years after I graduated, one of the Bowman boys was on my junior high team at Ferndale. And I met the father, who was a coach at Western, and he was really a good coach. Uh, and we started running together, and I guess we continued, and then he left Western, and Ralph shows up. And if, if you ever want to read something on sports psychology, probably the, the editor, or the first person to write, this can be Ralph Vernacchia. And he was a, a great coach and continued till Pee Wee came along. And you know those three guys in a row, uh, the last 45 years, I think, have really made uh, Western be something big in a track and field cross country. I need to thank 35 years of Ferndale High School runners. My, my runs weren't solo all the time. Every night we'd meet in, front, in the annex building for many of the years. You, know, you look out the um, door into the rain and the northeast are blowing things by and, and everybody just stands there for you know 20 minutes and finally one of us makes the move. I hope it was me most of the time. And uh, there we'd go. Uh, but it, it makes it a lot easier when you have somebody to run with, uh, somebody to enjoy the cold with you. 
I know you guys all ventured out today on this cold winter day, um, but, but sometimes it does get worse in this part of the territory. I specifically need to uh, thank Tori Lingbloom, who I don't think is here. Um, during the summers, I'd make a diary for the kids, and there'd be 10-day stretches instead of your normal weekly things, and so that you can just figure out your weekly average by moving the decimal point over. So the first uh, 10 days of 1975 summer, I ran 169 miles. Now that's 10 days, not a week. And I'm pretty proud of myself. And Tori came back from visiting his sister in Pullman. And I said, look, Tor, 169 miles. Said, oh, what went wrong? And, and, <laughs> now th this kid is coming out, he just finished the ninth grade. Uh, and he had run 176 miles. So, well, you know, I can't uh, let that beat me. So I ran 185 or 189 the next 10 days. And I, I took the lead. But when I did that, I thought, gosh, I think I could run 200 miles in 10 days. And so I did. And then I thought, gosh, if I just run a little bit more, I can hit 1,000 miles for the first 50 days. And once I got there, I think I was getting to be bulletproof, and I... I ran 1,200 miles the next 50 days. Uh, a lot of it goes right back to Tori. Uh, I need to thank Jay Camerzell, who's sitting back there somewhere. And one day in July, I went to the Shorewood area and ran the Pacific Northwest Hour Run Championships. And I ran just a few yards short of 11 and a half miles in the hour on the track. And didn't have time to you know, sit around and boast or anything. I had to go straight to Ferndale uh, to get ready for practice, and we were going to run out to Custer and back, which is 12 miles. And we made it to Custer without any problems. But Jay the Jet realizes I've just run as hard as I can for an hour on the track, and so he puts in a move. And it was a real challenge for a while, but he forced me to respond and I just dumped everybody, and then added three miles at the end. Um, it, it's things like this that were really helpful, because, you know, then that October is when I did set the American record. Um, I started to feel tired around 45 miles. Now, that's hard for me to even say right now, because I, f I feel tired at five miles. But uh, it, these people were all very helpful. And, and I thank them all. I, lastly, but not least important, uh, thank my family for um, always being there. Uh, my brother Don came to most of my meets. He had never seen me run until I ran the, the record run in Seattle, and, and he was so nervous. And here, he was the star in high school. He scored something like 15 touchdowns. Lost to Ferndale, though. Go get him. Uh, and, um, he, he was so excited that he, he started talking about records all the time. Well, I don't want to, you don't start a race to set a record, because now you're going to topple over about 25 miles. But uh, my, my brother was always there. Uh, when I married Barbie, first, th first thing she said was, I'm not going to interfere with your running. And she never did. Um, I have run with all of my kids. Um, Rob grew up, most of his life was with his mother in Oregon. But I have pictures in my, a picture on my family room wall of Rob and me coming down the driveway with our running gear on. And uh, he's probably three years old. And, <laughs> and he's here today, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I think the next big one was Joel. Um, Hopper had told him about all these things that I'd done, and Joel wasn't impressed. And, but he got about to the last thing, and he said, if Dad makes it to February 15th, he'll have finished 25 years without a miss. And the little guy, I think he was eight, said, I'm going to run with him. And I, oh, gosh, you know, I run to school. I run to the kids. I run home. Uh, I said, well, I'm not going to wait around and get all tight and have to go. Said, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. And I said, well, it's got to be at least a mile. I'm not going back up that hill just to to run 100 yards or something. Well, the hill's longer than that. And he said, I'll do it. And to be honest, his seventh day was three quarters of a mile. So when 
The streak registry said it doesn't count if you're not a mile. He lost a week, but he's run over 20 years without a miss. I, I'm skipping one person for a minute. And now I run with Hopper, who's gone over five years without missing a day. It's not that I didn't run with Betty Lou, or Paige, you might call her. Um, my wife thinks she ran with me, so I've got to be careful here. We, we moved to Spokane for a, about four years, and Betty Lou and I would go out to run together. But, you know, that was within the last eight years. Uh, we were together about three steps, and she was gone. Um, and so I did run with her, and guarding her the whole time. Thank you, dear. But, um, yeah, am I seven minutes up? I, I want to mention, she was way over seven minutes. <laughs> I, I, I was... Uh, oh, uh, I want to thank everybody who, who has sh shown up today. There's four people from the Lake Stevens High School class of 62, including the, the famous Linda Goodrich. And, uh, and I have a, several runners and from high school, and Emily, who's a, a national placer in the 50-kilometer run, and all my old friends. Um, oh, I can't forget this. <laughs> as soon as we're finished here, we're going to go to Fairhaven Park and just run an easy three-mile run. And it's, it's going to be on the flat, and you're all invited. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you, everybody. It's interesting that Jim is shaking Dominic's hands because uh, you know what I'm going to say. Dominic had the longest acceptance speech in the history of the Hall of Fame. <laughs> he made Jim's look like nothing, so don't worry about it. Our final inductee is Orlando Steinauer. Orlando, I got it. Orlando, a consensus football All-America defensive back at Western, played 12 years in the Canadian Football League and has been an assistant coach in the CFL for the last five seasons. Last November, with Orlando serving as defensive coordinator, the Hamilton Tiger Cats reached the Grey Cup, which is the Canadian version of the Super Bowl, uh, the CFL championship game. Orlando had a stellar career as a safety, safety in the CFL from 1996 to 2008, playing for the Ottawa Rough Riders, Hamilton Tiger Cats, Toronto Argonauts. He finished with 49 career interceptions and his career interception return yards of 1,178 ranked second in CFL history. A five-time CFL All-Star and a six-time East Division All-Star, um, Orlando played on two Grey Cup championship teams in 1999 with Hamilton and in 2004 with Toronto. He also was a Grey Cup winner in 2012 as the defensive backs coach for Toronto. As a senior at Western in 1995, Steinauer was the NAIA national leader with a Columbia Football Association and school record 10 pass interceptions on a 9-1 team, that team won its first nine games, that reached the first round of the national playoffs. He was named to four All-America teams. Steinauer's career total of 20 interceptions is second on Western's all-time list. Three of those interceptions came in a 19-16 win over Central Washington, directed by future NFL quarterback John Kitna. Uh, it's interesting, the next year, he was, Orlando was a stu student assistant coach on a team that went back to the national championship game, and um, that was in 1996. A Linwood High School graduate, Steinauer is married to the former Gina Sampson, a standout women's basketball player who was un inducted into Western's Athletic Hall of Fame in 2010. They have three children, Kiana, Reina, and Taya. Uh, Kiana is a big lady now. She's a big woman. She's really awesome. And we remember her when she was here. She's now here.
here. And she is a ball player. But I'm not going to say anything more because my compliance officer is here. <laughs> okay. Orlando's presenters are former teammate Miguel Perez, now a vice principal at Federal Way High School, and Doug Biddle, is defensive, uh, Orlando's defensive secondary coach at Western, and now a businessman uh, living in uh, Spokane. And we'll start out with um, Doug Biddle. Okay, I hope I don't get too moist, mushy. Um, this gentleman uh, means a lot to me. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Western Washington University, Paul Madison, Steve Card for asking me to have the privilege to do this. Um, being here, just to be at the Hall of Fame is, is huge, but to be asked to say a few words about one of the most genuine, um, compassionate people that I've ever met is another, um, you know, honor for me. Um, he has uh, and will do anything to help others, whether as a player, coach, friend, which at this time in my life, I consider one of my best friends. Even though our paths do not get to cross that often um, at this point in our, t in our lives. Um, someone asked me, what was my first impression of O? And it was, I got invited up here to um, coach at Western Washington University, and so I started observing film. And the first impression that I had was, I have a lockdown corner. And having a lockdown left corner is huge. You have a foundation. The person that the ball is going to be thrown at more than anyone else. So with that, I had a basis. Um, the Excuse me. Um, I hope you can understand um, that with that foundation and with this position, we were able to develop the rest of it. As a person, my first impression of him was that smile. It never goes away. Um, happy going, charismatic, enjoying life, and this has never changed. I don't want this to sound like an obituary, because it's not. <laughs> um, he has so much more to give to the world. He's a community leader. He does a lot for the youth in Canada at this point, which is, you know, just his nature. As I got to um, know him, I saw much more than the smile. He's a leader, not a follower. So I knew I had to get his buy-in to my philosophy and the way that I coached. And I found out that I was called Sergeant Biddle. But with his help and leadership, the other defensive backs bought in. With this, we had the foundation and the results, results show for themselves. We had the most productive defenses in the history of Western while we were here. Um, Robin Ross, um, I see him back there. I learned a tremendous amount of football from him, and I thank him. Um, my favorite memory in watching him was as a, we had a defensive battle going with the arch rivals, Central Washington. And he proceeded to pick the former mentioned John Kitna, and they were driving into the uh, red zone. And one yard before he got to the red zone, I mean into the end zone, he stopped, drug his foot across the goal line, spiked the ball, procededly followed by a flag. <laughs> I uh, asked to have him put on the phones, and as he's looking up there with his smile, I just said, I'll take that penalty any time. <laughs> we won the game 10-3. And, you know, for watching that and seeing that, it was huge. Another moment that was um, watching him play um, in the CFL. And while he was playing in the CFL, um, we went up to a game in Vancouver, and he picked the ball, 
And proceedingly, he started um, running to our area where we were seated, seating. And all of a sudden, I see, oh, he's going to throw me the ball. <laughs> and I better catch it because I cannot let him win a game that we used to play before every game. But I got the ball, handed it to his uh, grandparents, uh, Gene and Bonnie Steinhauer, who are uh, instrumental, and I love them to death. And um, the, um, after uh, that um, you know, um, game, um, it was just a tremendous effort. I also had the opportunity, as Paul uh, talked about, that Orlando was able to come back and coach with us for one year. And during that year, his impact was, you know, it was evident and it was on for, it lasted for years afterwards, the, the power that he had. Um, you know, to uh, the points I have to say that was one of my uh, fondest memories was playing catch with him before every game. We'd stand 10 yards apart and we'd score points. Headshots, chest. Anywhere else that you threw didn't count. And um, it was just too much fun to be able to do that with this individual. It's funny when relationships change. From going from being his coach to now at the point where I had an opportunity to coach after um, the, my career here, um, I was able to coach an arena football team, and I didn't understand these, these uh, wide receivers running at you, you know? And so my phone, I have to pick it up and call this individual who's been doing it for years in the CFL because they can, you know, they run at you at will. They're, you know, they can have men in motion. So the paths change from coach, mentor, to now he, mentoring me. Um, I will end with just saying that um, I enjoy uh, every moment of my, my time with him and that if ever I was to get a call from him when he does get a head coaching job, I would come out of retirement and work for him in a minute. Thanks. Miguel Perez. Jim, I'm winded walking up here. <laughs> so uh, when I was at uh, Western a long time ago, I took a communications class. I actually got a B in it. <laughs> but today I'm going to fail because um, I'm going to read right off of here, so no eye contact. <laughs> um, I am taking a deep breath. Um, I'm a bit nervous to be up here. Um, but. Uh, much more, that's much more overshadowed by the joy I have for this opportunity. The induction of Orlando Steinauer into the Western Hall of Fame, that's kind of a great thing, I guess, but um, reality is, honestly, are any of us surprised? Um, well, I'm being a little bit facetious, I'm a bit, uh, I'm, a, I'm in fact thrilled to have the opportunity to say a few words about one of my best friends and influential people in my life. And I get to experience this moment with many Western friends, familiar faces, uh, and close family. And we get to be back on Western's campus, where some of Orlando's uh, story began. And we get to do this in the context of Western football. So nervous, yes, but gracious. Before I begin rambling, I want to point out that we wouldn't be here for, uh, in this moment without a few people. So first and foremost, a huge amount of gratitude is in order. And uh, before I thank the university for acknowledging Orlando, the most vital thank you must be completed to Mr. and Mrs. Jean Bonnie St and Bonnie Steinauer and Margaret Steinauer. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Uh, you did an amazing job, and without a doubt, um, the amount of time, effort, patience, questioning, and wondering you put into this man paid off. Without you, you wouldn't, he wouldn't be who he is today, nor would he have experienced a journey of getting here. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today to support these inductees and uh, great individuals. Thank you, Western Washington University and the Athletic Department for acknowledging Orlando and the other inductees in this capacity. 
Thank you for putting on such a great event for uh, all three of these athletes, and thank you, Paul Madison, for reaching out to me. Um, now you can, I'll, let, uh, I'll get my babbling started here. I've known Orlando since the fall of 95, much shorter span than many of you here today, but naturally I'm a lot younger than most of you because you're in your 40s. <laughs> um, a quick memory, uh, my first fall here walking through the parking lot uh, on the way to some of our, one of our first practices, I saw a Toyota Corolla in the parking lot um, and a license plate that said, Sir Too Smooth. And uh, I just thought, wow, that's a stupid license plate. <laughs> And uh, I get into the locker room, and I'm talking to the, my, the guy next to me in the locker room. I'm like, man, did you see that license plate out there? That's kind of stupid. Oh, I say, who the heck has that? And he uh, points over and points at Orlando. And I, first of all, when Orlando was playing, uh, he's in shape, I'm going to say. And uh, I saw him in the locker room, and I'm like, that's his car? Okay, well, I, I got to get a license plate like that now, too. <laughs> so... Um, so that's one of the things I, I, I kind of wanted uh, to be like, oh, like, uh, besides the, the mustache also. If you guys see that in the picture in there, you got to point that out. Um, um, seriously, I had the, the, the pleasure of watching him play at every level and even beating him on a slant my freshman year, which he'll never admit to. Um, it actually happened. I was a receiver at the time. Um, but I, I had the honor of having him uh, be one of the most impactful, along with Coach Biddle, coaches I've ever had. Uh, it's evident that Orlando Steinar has been a uh, part of the Western football landscape for going on about a third decade in some way, shape, or form. Breaking records, beginning a, a run of years in which Western football saw its most prominent years in those early and mid-90s. His natural evolution to coaching and contributing to the dominating play of his secondary was evident. Um, we could easily reminisce about literally, literally hundreds of plays we've seen him make over the years, the mountains of accolades he's earned at every level of the game. However, that would probably take quite a bit of time. Um, and I, how long I got left? How much time? However, it would be a mistake not to acknowledge the character which drives Orlando. We've all seen him light up a room when he walks in, make spectacular plays on the field, get the crowd involved in the game in more ways than one, watch him set records and leave his mark at every level of the sport. However, without that character, work ethic, dedication, drive to succeed, and his devotion almost to a fault, his success never would have uh, manifested. I had the opportunity to touch base with a few individuals um, recently, and they shared a little bit of information with me and some stories about Orlando, so I kind of want to relay those quickly. Um, I had the, the pleasure of speaking with Greg Mallow, uh, class of 94. Uh, who shared a story with me, and uh, he mentioned in the 94 season, I wasn't here yet, uh, was a season which O tore his ACL. Malo recalls after sitting out a few weeks, O decided that bracing his knee would help the team more than sitting out the rest of the season. Orlando's questionable decision helped push the 94 defense into becoming the number one scoring defense in the country. With, O's, uh, with O back in the lineup, he played a key role in their playoff victory versus the number one team in the country, and at that time, the biggest win in school history. Malo believed that the, this example of putting team before self was an illustration of O's selfish, selfishness, but in reality was just be, uh, O being O. I also had the honor of touching base uh, with Gina Sampson Steinauer, who also shared something about Orlando's character. I know he's nervous right now. Uh, <laughs> rather than uh, physical ability, she shared with me that there's no question that when Orlando was devoted, dedicated, and put his mind to working hard, sometimes other things, even their relationship, may have taken a back seat. In most cases, football always came first over anything else. She recalled his work ethic in rehab and back from his ACL tear in nine months. She noted uh, he's the hardest worker she knows. Gina even went as far as to say that uh, she credits her success as an athlete um, from how hard he pushed her. She felt he made her an All-American and taught her that hard work pays off. And as we know, she's an inductee in the Hall of Fame in 2010. I'm fortunate enough to have definitely seen him in many different lights over the years. Uh, eating a burger in literally two bites, uh, <laughs> knocking over a glass with his paws, um, snoring during one of his five-minute naps. I even got to watch one of the most smooth and fluid athletes completely be clumsy from time to time. But no matter what we were doing, he somehow made things into a competition and um, ended up pushing us all in some way, shape, or form. He's one of the most competitive individuals I know. We spent countless hours in Carver playing basketball, in which case most of those games I won. <laughs> Uh, no matter what, though, uh, 
In the end, he, he, his drive to get better and focus on improvement shines in everything that he does. Of all things Orlando has accomplished, I was most impressed with and proud of as a character in staying true to who he was and is. Even through the multitudes of adversity that he's faced uh, at every level of his life, with his uh, competitive nature, his ability to mask frustration, inability to say no and keep his eyes focused on the prize, he wouldn't have been the best athlete, leader, teammate, role model, mentor, or comprehensive representation of Western football, or most important and vital of all, an amazing father, um, with, with, um, without a doubt. Even though he left Western campus to continue his professional playing career, his smile, records, personality, attitude lingers on campus and in the halls of Carver Gym. We're lucky to have him as a friend, brother, and even some as a father, but today Western Washington University is placing Orlando Steinauer where he is destined to be, and today Western Washington is lucky to have such a phenomenal individual to represent Western and its long tradition in football. Congratulations, brother. Thank you for setting standard and a precedent for Western football and us. Hello. And thank you for your inspiration, quality, character, and motivation to be the best. Um, and to end, I'd just like to announce that uh, out front in the foyer out here, we'll be selling uh, license plates that say Sir, uh, Sir <laughs> Too Smooth, so tell me five dollars. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, again, uh, this is a, a great honor. Uh, very proud to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'll make it here. Thank you, uh, Coach Biddle, man. <sighs> Truly, I'm not up here today because of me. It, uh, it's a complete team effort. and. Uh, Doug, I could talk for about 20 minutes, but I just want to say thank you, man. This isn't a good start. <laughs> I got to tighten up. That's what I tell my players, tighten up. All right. I'm all right now. Let's go. All right. Miguel, uh, super proud of you, brother. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, uh, just surpassing all your stereotypical expectations has been amazing getting your masters from Hawaii doing your own thing uh, super proud of you and I, I just want to thank you thank you guys for your kind words I uh, can't really express it right now uh, Carrie Jim uh, congratulations it's a pleasure to, to share this day with you uh, Paul did me a disservice brother you put me after Jim <laughs> 500 miles I mean, I'm turning my car in after 500 miles. Uh, after, if at any point up here I break into coaching mode, just excuse me, I may walk away from the mic. It's just, uh, I'm used to being in front of the guys with no paper and just uh, telling them how to motivate and how to get to the next level and, and do what we have to do to win that day. So, uh, like I said, today isn't, today isn't really about me. Uh, when I got the call, it, uh, it settled in. Uh, some of you have heard the expression, the, the turtle on the fence post, and that's really what I am. Uh, I know some of you are saying, well, turtle probably doesn't want to be there. But I'm, uh, I'm extremely proud to be here. And obviously that turtle didn't get there by himself. And uh, I was trying to think of some creative ways to thank people and to get them recognized, and uh, I didn't come up with any. So you're going <laughs> to... That's a true story. So you're going to have to bear with it. I'm going to list some names, and I apologize that a lot of you aren't going to know the names, but uh, it'd be a disservice if they didn't get recognized. I see, uh, I just, you know, I see faces out here that are just, uh, I just appreciate your time. I understand everybody has lives, and I think that time is the most valuable thing you can spend. Uh, first thing, uh, my grandfather down here taught me the chain of command, right? And, uh, uh, I learned that at a young age, and so the first person I just want to thank is the Lord, because uh, single, single uh, only child, no brothers, no sisters, no stepbrothers, no stepsisters. Uh, my mom raised me by herself, and so I spent a lot of time alone, and I know I wasn't alone, I had guidance. So uh, I know the Lord was always with me. 
Uh, my mom had one, just me, so I like to think she got it perfect the first time. <laughs> so she didn't need any more. So she got me, and that's, that was enough. All right? So uh, obviously got to thank uh, my rock right now, Gina, who, uh, who's been inducted uh, to the Hall of Fame. I'm getting razzed by my kids, my youngest. Uh, they're saying, so let me get this right. Uh, you're not in the Hall of Fame? And it's just like, no. So now I can go back to Raina and Taya, who are 10 and 9, and, and I can tell them that, that I'm in. So I just want to thank Gina for her support. Uh, she used to road trip. Uh, one of her great friends, uh, Tira, is here. And they used to take uh, long trips to Eastern Oregon, all the way to Western Oregon, all those long trips that everybody here knows about. And uh, they, they were full of support. So I just want to thank her for that. Uh, also, now I know when I close the door that I know the kids will be taken care of, so I'm super proud of her for that. Um, Kiana? Uh, uh, my three kids, uh, let's put it like this. You're why I breathe. That's you know how much I love you. Right. Uh, I want to thank my mom. She's not able to be here today. I apologize. I didn't know this was coming. <laughs> I mean, I gotta tighten back up. All right. I want to thank my mom, who uh, her journey hasn't been the best. Uh, she struggled, but. Uh, she gave me everything I needed, and that was love. Uh, I just want to thank her. Uh, Grandpa, uh, this is the, the rock of our family. Thank you for teaching me my work ethic. Thank you for getting me up at 6 in the morning, making me cry. <laughs> for making me run around Green Lake at 4 years old. <laughs> it helped. We did it, Gramps. Uh, my grandma. Um, I can hear her yelling from heaven now. She's, uh, she was unbelievable. She was everywhere. They didn't miss a game. I know... Uh, Carrie, you spoke of your folks, and they were the same. Uh, grandma's unbelievable, and uh, all, all I can say is she deserves to be here today, but I know she's watching. Okay. Uh, second, let me run through a list of names. Uh, when I came to Western, it was just a huge family. I know it uh, seems so much easier with basketball or something. You say thanks to a couple of coaches, but with football, you have so many other pieces involved. You're talking about... The ultimate team sport, in my opinion. You're talking about personalities from everywhere. Um, what was bigger than that about Weston is when you go through Sam Carver. I just have to run through these names uh, because, again, this isn't, this isn't about me. This is about everybody who had a piece of it, and they need to be recognized. Um, at the time, President Morris and her husband, Linda Goodrich, Eileen Codlin, Steve Card, Ted Pratt, Kunle, Steve Voigt, Kevin Fenwick, Paul Madison, uh, Paul, uh, Paul's got an awesome hook shot. I don't know if anybody has, has seen this. He used to sit, you're done? This guy used to go before games and he'd make half court hook shots. It's unbelievable. Uh, bigger than that, these, uh, all these people that I'm mentioning here, that just the character of them and the way they cared, they, were, they had nothing to do with football as far as practicing, but they had everything to do with building, building what this program is today. So I have to recognize them. Uh, bigger than that, uh, when my grandma passed last May, um, I was up there speaking, and three rows to my right was Paul Madison. And that's the type of man he is. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Butch Kamina, photographic memory, can't forget you. All right? Uh, I did tear my ACL. I was uh, coming off a decent season by some people's standards where I was... Again, these are votes, but voted as an honorable, honorable mention All-American as a sophomore. I tore my ACL uh, in the second game um, the following year. And I have to thank uh, Dr. Michael Thorpe for doing the surgery. Um, 
It's unbelievable. Um, the funny, that one quick story about Dr. Thorpe was uh, he did the surgery and he said, you know, this is generally about nine months, you know, give or take, but you'll have a clean slate if you have any desires to play further. So, you know, me, as you're learning about me, I should say, uh, that was not acceptable answer. So uh, I, I was uh, busting my tail and that's where um, Lori DeCubra comes in. And I'll never forget Lori and I appreciate you because she pushed me. Uh, all this credit's coming to me, but uh, I'd leave my boring anthro class and I'd go right down to the training room <laughs> and she was waiting for me and pushed me and pushed me and uh, she helped me come back stronger. Dr. Howe, same way. Um, so again, all this is about other people. Uh, today's a great chance to recognize those people. Again, this isn't about me. Um, obviously, uh, great supporter, and they're out here today. I got to thank Rick Adelstein and his family. Uh, bigger than that, just for his friendship, giving back to the community. Uh, just he knows how much I care about him and his family, so I want to thank you guys for being here. Mark and Doug, uh, KPUG. I mean, you got to remember when I went on to play pro ball, everybody's on national TV, and you know, I'm in locker rooms with people from Michigan, and they make you stand up there and sing your fight song, and wasn't recognizable to most. But I was still proud to get up there and sing the Viking fight song and uh, tell them that we had the pleasure of being on uh, KBOS at a time, a time or two. And, K, and KPUG, they should look that up. That's what they did, they laughed. I gotta move on to the coaches now. Uh, you gotta start with Rob Smith, he was our leader, right? He, has a, he had a vision and he was able to surround himself with great men. And those great men, it was passed down. So it was a snowball effect and it rolled downhill. Um, he had a vision and he followed through. Uh, the first story I have to tell of memory is, so we're going down to uh, Western Oregon and we're on the bus and we're down there and I have my, my great friend Mike Rillo who's here with his mother and his children and his wife. And uh, we're in a, we're in the dorm room, or the dorm room, the, uh, the hotel room. And I'm thinking we have plenty of time. So we're just sitting there and watching another football game. And here comes, I can't call you Doug, Coach Biddle. Here comes Coach Biddle and he goes, what are you guys doing? I go, well, we got time. He goes, no, the bus is leaving. So, all right, so here we go get on the bus. And uh, we go to get on the bus and <laughs> you have to know Coach Biddle. He's all in on everything. Like if you're driving in the car and you say, hey, let's go down to the park and let's throw a Frisbee. Okay. And let you just go get a Frisbee. You know, he's going to pull over and go get her. Like he's all in. There's no, there's no gray area with coach. And he goes, coach goes, and the bus is pulling away. True story. I can't make it up. So we're, this is day of the game now. Day of the game. And, he, and coach goes, I found out what was important. He says, I can't believe he left me. I'm like, you? <laughs> And Rillo. He left me in Rillo. So the bus is gone. I'm not lying here. Now this, the bus is gone. And so I'm like this and I'm looking at him and he's looking at me like you did this. <laughs> so so uh, I said okay. And so I'm looking and I go well I have a credit card. You know I was over at the, the bookstore. Finally got my Citibank $500 limit. <laughs> so I was feeling pretty good about my college life. And I go, well, I have a credit card. Well, I'm thinking the adult mature thing is to say, I got it. So we call a cab. True story now, we call a cab. And we get in and I go, well, I have a card. He goes, use it. Okay, so <laughs> we get in there. We get in the, and we're going in the cab and I'm watching this meter and I'm just praying. And it's up to 70 bucks, 50 bucks. So we're going to the game in a cab. <laughs> All right. And he's like, I, you know, Doug, or coach is just sitting, I just can't believe he left me. I just can't believe he left me. <laughs> so, I, this is a true story. Now, here comes Gail Rillo and her mother. And this is true. Ask her if I'm lying after. And we're looking. Now, the last thing she thinks she's going to see on game day is her son and me in a cab. <laughs> so, we're going down there and we're looking, and we're like, pull over. And they double look, pull over. So needless to say, the, the meter shut off about $72, got to Western Oregon, and the first face I see is Rob Smith. That's what I did. 
And so Rillo was first thought, and then he saw Coach and walked right behind me. So I walked up to Rob and I said, uh, nothing. I just looked at him. And he goes, do you want to handle this now or later? I said, later. He said, have a good game. <laughs> we won that day. We won that day. Uh, another Rob Smith story, you know, he was a, a fair guy, serious guy, didn't laugh much. Of course, I didn't see that side. Find the local barber, get that number two shaved in my head, WW in the back. And Rob really wasn't about that individual stuff. But that's okay. I was in the front of the stretching line feeling good. And he goes, hey, oh, what's that? And I said, oh, just a little fun, coach, homecoming. He goes, is that in case we forget your number? <laughs> <laughs> you got it, coach. Uh, most of all, Rob Smith was a winner and deserves to be recognized today. Uh, there, in came another coach that brought instant uh, respect. Uh, Robin Ross came in, who's here today. And I appreciate you for being here. Uh, two quick things about Coach Ross. Uh, one, you know his presence is big, and you know he went on to be the head coach here. <clears throat> I thought he was our punt return coach, and I returned punts. And uh, I began to think that my middle name was ISO the ball up the field. So he was always telling me to hit that thing north and south. And uh, I thank him for that, because it, it, it helped me from getting my head taken off. The other one is a little interesting story that may not be funny, but for those of you that are here, it, uh, it'll ring a bell. We had a player here named Scott Easley. Well, he was about 290 pounds, and nobody really messed with him much. And uh, he always would wear, sorry for the visual, but he'd wear like Speedo front with like a tight-fitting back, like just these nasty shorts. And <laughs> it looked like, and from the back, it just wasn't nice, it, you know. <laughs> Looked like a couple of turkeys wrestling or something. It was bad. <laughs> anyways, anyways, um, I mean, but nobody said anything to this guy. He's this big guy. And one day at practice, Coach Ross was the new guy, and he just goes, easily get up and get some shorts. I'm tired of looking at your ass. <laughs> and, and that brought about the team short for Western Washington, so I thank you for that, because nobody had any gall. <laughs> Nobody had any goal to tell Scott anything different. So, uh, Coach Biddle, uh, obviously the rock of the secondary. Uh, you have to be recognized today. Uh, I think one of my things that I really appreciate about Coach is that uh, he cared about us as people first and as athletes second. Uh, he'd have us over to his house to eat. NAIA Butch, we can do that. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so he'd have us over to his house, anything that we needed. He was there for us, and uh, thank you for paving the way. Uh, one, one good story, again, Western Oregon was one good story, but another one was, I was at, we were in Linfield, and they were pounding the ball at us, and I, they were playing us in a tight end set. Sorry for no, the football people that aren't interested, but <laughs> basically they had people coming at me all game, and I didn't get to defend any passes, so being a lockdown corner meant nothing. Uh, they were coming at me, and it was new to me. I barely remember... Uh, I barely remember halftime, and, and uh, coach goes, I'm just sitting there, and he just looks at me, he goes, what are you doing? I said, it's halftime. He said, it's over. Well, he's just forcing me, he goes, oh, oh you got to get yourself back out on the field. Well, uh, long story short, we go, on, we go on to beat Linfield, which was an important game, and uh, keep our streak going. Uh, another name that I need to mention, Scott Boswick. Uh, he's no longer with us. He helped recruit me. Uh, he was part of the, one of the guys that helped get this program turned around. And uh, I know he's smiling today, and he deserves to be recognized. Uh, again, I got to just throw these names real quick. I'm sorry, bear with me. I know I'm over seven minutes, and, but just <laughs> stay with me, all right? Uh, Missile, Tripp, Hodgkinson, Artie Holmes, Mark Stewart, Kurt Kriskovich, and anybody else that planted seeds. Uh, it was a pleasure to watch you, Tom, grow. Never called you Tom in my life. Coach Missile. Uh, I watched this guy head up our water troughs. Yeah, we didn't have Gatorade bottles. So <laughs> PVC pipe, and I used to watch his work ethic, and he did it without complaining. Thank everybody, and I wish everybody health and happiness. Thank you very much.
your record might have been broken. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I think you might, you might be off the hook. Those are our uh, Western Athletic Hall of Fame inductees for 2015, Kerry Caviezel, Jim Pearson, and Orlando Steinauer. Thank you, and thank you for staying here and, and uh, seeing this through. It's been an awesome day. Thank you.